Father, we thank you very much this morning for the privilege of access. Thank you for your spirit is here to do us good. Have your way, we ask. Say what you want to say. Help us to see how it applies to our lives. Confirm the same with signs following. When we are done, it will be clear that we have been in your presence. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We are talking about a better yield. I believe we'll be concluding today. Luke chapter 8 from verse 5. Luke's gospel, the 8th chapter from the 5th verse. As so I went out to sow his seed, Jesus speaking. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. We are talking about a better yield. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about constants and variables. Jesus taught this parable, or gave this illustration, describing four different kinds of ground. In their time, a sower slung a bag across his chest and put grains in it and would go and throw liberally and just walk and just throw seed. So no matter how good he was, some will fall on different kinds of ground. And we saw that day that the seed is the word of God according to scriptures. So the Lord, of course, is the sower of the seed. So we saw that God is constant. His word is constant. It wasn't the fault of the seed. It was different kinds of ground that produced different results. And according to the parable, when Jesus explained it, and it's in all synoptic gospels, it's in Matthew 13, it's in Mark 4, it's in Luke chapter 8. He made clear that the first kind of ground represents people who hear God's word and don't believe, and so they are not saved. Second kind of ground, those who are shallow. So there is ground all right, and they respond very quickly, but there's no root in them. And when challenges of life come, particularly for the sake of the word, they drop out. And then the third kind of ground are those who yield, but other things choke the word. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches. So there might even be legitimate concerns. And then God's word is choked. And so it doesn't produce. And then he talked about the fourth kind of ground, which is what we all should be interested in that brings forth fruit. And as we just saw now, a hundredfold. So we saw that God is constant. His word is constant. Even Satan is constant. But we as men are variables. And of course, different kinds of ground as we have seen are variables. And then last week, we emphasized the fact that even though the way we saw it directly is right, different kinds of ground, but we might also see it another way. It might be the same person at different seasons of life. If you faint in the day of adversity, the Bible says, then your strength is small. So somebody can be like good ground when things are going good. I once worked with somebody many years ago who, when things were fine, he backslid. When things were tough, he serves God. I thought that was strange. I thought it would be easier to serve God when things are okay. That's why I eat in plenty and be satisfied and do what? Bless the name of the Lord your God. That's what I thought is natural. But he, whenever things were okay, he would backslide. And then when things were tough, he would run back to God and serve God. I mean, the way I am wired, I will be grateful to God for whatever good. So I, I want to stay okay with God so I'll continue to enjoy the blessings. But once things were okay for him, once he had some chain in his pocket, he backslid. And then he will struggle and get back. He ended up in jail, you know. This person I'm talking about, he stole, he arranged, I couldn't believe it, he arranged to steal some important parts of uh, an extra equipment where we worked at that time. Anyway, he ended up in jail. If you faint in the day of adversity, it took me into that, then your strength is small. So there's some people, they're not the same kind of ground all the time. At some kinds of time, they're this way. At other kinds of time, maybe when there are challenges, they're a different kind of ground. They don't produce. And then we said, another way we can see it is different areas of life. So that widow went to Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 4, and said, you know my husband, you know he was a man who feared God. However, he left death behind. Now the creditors have come to take the children. So spiritually, he was okay, but financially, he wasn't okay. There are people who are good Christians who will say they know how to pray and all of that. 
but uh, their health isn't fine. One area of life isn't fine. So they are like different kinds of ground in different areas of life. How many people know we can be balanced? That's God's mind. We can be balanced. So we started to see last Sunday how that in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, incidentally, all three places, what I'm saying now is in verse 8 of them. Matthew 13, 8, Mark 4, 8, Luke 8, 8. In Matthew's gospel, it's in descending order. 100 fold, 60 fold, 30 fold. Now you can't make a doctrine out of it because in Mark's gospel, it's the opposite. It says 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. And then in Luke that we just read, it's just 100 fold, not even 60 or 30. Putting all together, it means 100 fold is the maximum. That's what God has in mind for us. But even in good ground, there are varying yields. That's what we learn from that. In good ground, there are varying yields. Meaning, we can all be Christians and all of that. So we all attend the same church. We're pastored by the same set of people. We are in the same home cell or activity. How come we don't get the same result in life? How come some seem to be doing okay and others are not doing okay? So even in good ground, there are varying yields. And we are trying to learn some of the things that may be responsible for this. Never exhaustive. God will keep showing us more things. If you hear me preach this next time, I'm going to know more than now. Amen. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to be for all of us. So we have to be growing. You have to, we have to keep increasing and all that. So you can add your own points. This is just what we see uh, as per now. So Jesus illustrated with agricultural things. Most of them were farmers. Not all of them. He himself was a carpenter. And Peter and Co were fishermen. But most of them were farmers. And so they could relate to the things he was saying. Okay. Now, we started with the seeds factor. Just by virtue of how they sowed seed at that time, if you put in more, you are likely to get more. So we're talking about a better yield. Don't forget. Our lives to be more productive. I don't know about you. I want my life to be more productive. Yeah, I want better yield in every area of life. I, I'm not maximum yet. Far from it. So if there can be very yields even in good ground, that I'm good ground now should not satisfy me until it's maximum of what it can be according to God. Anyone who sows sparingly, the Bible says, shall live sparingly. So it means the more you put in, the more you get. So we started with seeds factor. And I remember emphasizing that, that don't, don't think um, I know much about agricultural science. No, no. No, just a basic, you know, ordinary level from three are Greek, okay? The junior school now. Nothing more than common sense are Greek. But I believe it makes sense what we're talking about. So putting more seeds, probability, it suggests you're likely to get more. Yeah, I know in agri, there are times you even need to take out some of what you put in when there are too many. You know, I know that. But that's, I'm saying I'm just basic agri is what I'm saying. I'm not talking about agri that went to school. So somebody comes to church only on Sundays. is getting some seeds. But as somebody else comes during the week and receives more. So there is more probability of better yield. Now another person doesn't just come for midweek. Takes time personally to study. Every once in a while, it gets more yield. But somebody does it every day. If God were to be fair, should they get the same result? Of course not. So somebody who takes time every day, I remember we emphasized uh, the amplified version of a particular verse of scriptures. I'm deliberately not saying it, so if you didn't come so that you know you should come. Or I'll try to listen to it, okay? Yeah. How that the more thought you put in, the more is the yield that comes back to you. So the more you take time to focus on it and dig deep and work hard over it, the more it comes back to you. And we saw that it's in every area of life, it's true that the borrower is servant to the lender. So anybody who has much more of something will rule over somebody who doesn't have much of it. Whether it's spiritual things or other areas of life. So knowledge rules the world, we said that day. If you know the ways of God, you're going to rule over people who don't know the ways of God. Anything you know more than other people in. And so when we go to school and we attend seminars and all of that, it's all about knowledge. And of course, revelation knowledge beats any other kind of knowledge. So we talked about seeds factor. Secondly, we talked about soil factor. We've heard about manure already today. Compost, manure, fertilizer. We are all, all, all still saying the same thing, that good ground can be made better. The soil can be made richer through manure. It can be made richer. And so when it's richer, things are likely to bring forth better yield. And we said that day there are some Christians, they're Christians, right? They're always late. There are some Christians, they're always rude. So anything you need to add 
to minimize whatever you know is not supposed to be so as to make the ground that was good before better ground, then you should do it as a person. If it's making sense, please shout hallelujah. So I try to recapitulate, recapitulate a little bit. Now let's talk about the surface factor, number three now. And I'm talking about topography, you know, I'm just uh, calling it surface factor for the sake of this message. You know, there are grounds that are undulating. You've probably seen things that grew at the edge of a cliff, you know. It will grow all right. It's good ground all right. But by virtue of its being on that kind of surface, it wouldn't bring forth maximum. Imagine undulating surface. Imagine edge of a cliff. Imagine that kind of thing. So there are Christians who live borderline, if you ask me. That's how I like to put them. They're like borderline Christians. When they say something, you say, is it true? They say it's not a lie. I mean, is it that true? It's not when you ask somebody, is it true? You say it's not a lie. What, what, what was many of that? Years ago, I got to know about parents who had children then in Weinbrand Foundation School who went to the school authorities to say, ladies, that they were not to let their husbands know that they had paid the fees of the children. Now, think about that. They had paid. But they didn't want the husbands to know they had paid because they wanted to call it a higher figure than it was. I mean, husband were, and they were Christians. No members of this church. I wish I could say no member of the church is like that, but you know, I can't. I'll be deceiving myself. So that the amount to be exaggerated for the husbands, maybe they wanted to buy another shoe and they thought that was the best way to get it out. Were they Christians? Yes, they were. So as far as they were concerned, the husband would think, Buying another shoe was irresponsible. So the best way to get it was to inflate how much school fees would be. And then they paid and now wanted a receipt for a different amount. Of course, school authorities didn't grant it. They, they didn't have that kind of receipt. It's your headache, however you want to run your home. But you know there are marriages like that. There are marriages where parents teach their children to tell lies about things. So should it surprise them that those children turn out a particular way in life? All kinds of things that happen, you see. I'm going to look at a few examples now in the Bible because I, I believe many people might be here. I'm talking about surface factor, so diverting things, inconvenient jesting, you know, Ephesians 5. Let's read Ephesians 5. Uh, I have verses 3 and 4 in mind, but maybe we should start from verse 1, Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as their children and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for sin. So some things fit Christianity, some things don't. And look at the next thing. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. They don't fit Christianity, but rather giving of thanks. Hmm. Let's jump to verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and having, excuse me, I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So it's not everything that God finds acceptable. So how to live is to find out what God finds acceptable. What is okay by God. And that's what I'm to do. What's not okay by God. So you see, there are many Christians who the topography is not okay. It's undulating, it's, undulating, it's slanting. Or the thing is under a shade somewhere so it can't produce. It's good ground, all right. But the surface is not okay. There are misconceptions that people base their faith on. It's going to be clear in a little while. Matthew 13, 23. I remember emphasizing this when we talked about constants and variables. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. I want to emphasize that understands it. Because I hear Christians sometimes pray and their prayer shows lack of understanding of what the Bible says. They assume the Bible says something. Why don't you assume and just, just hear the Bible for what it says and then understand it and apply it instead of assuming this is what it says. I hear Christians pray that uh, people should deliver safely as it happened for Hebrew women rather than Egyptian women. I find it surprising because it's clear in the Bible that a Hebrew woman did not deliver separately from Egyptian women. 
It's clear in the Bible that those people just told lies. Let's read it for ourselves. Exodus 1 from verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other poor. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the bath stools, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall leave. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. So they didn't obey him, but saved the maid children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you not done this thing and saved the maid children alive? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. It's obvious it was a lie. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. The Bible already lets us know that they did not obey the king because they feared God. They didn't do what he said they should do. He said, this, this was the days of Moses. Now, when they have male children, kill them. When they have female children, let them, ah, no, how can we do that? So they didn't do it. They didn't obey the king. But they had to explain something to the king. So the king called him and said, you are sparing the male children. He said, ah, eh, they are not like our women. Eh, of course, it's obvious it was a lie. They were just telling a lie to satisfy the king. Why then did God reward them? Did God reward them for telling lies? No, God rewarded them because they feared God. The Bible tells us that. It's not because of lies. These were unbelievers, don't forget. Unbelievers who feared God. The Bible says, blessed everyone who fears God, who works in his ways. The fear of God was recognized by God. So God blessed them because they feared him. He didn't bless them because they told lies. Their own lies were the way they could handle the matter as far as unbelievers are concerned. God holds Christians to a higher standard. Can somebody say amen? Yeah, so why should I be praying as a Christian? I'm saying, let them deliver us. There's a scripture that says they shall be saved in childbearing. If they continue in faith and love, and that's what you put my faith on, not on a lie. What you see sometimes why we're talking about the surface, topography. When something is on the list, you know, yeah, there's yield, all right, but it's not maximum it can be because as we saw now, understanding. Maybe we should look at another. First Samuel 16. Let's start from verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reading over Israel? Fill your home with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have promised myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Let's examine that a little bit. Now, Samuel was a human being. Even though he's the one who ordained Saul, Saul was not the king of the nation. And God said to him, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? I'm through with him. That's serious. It means when somebody misses God, the person is as good as dead. Because it's dead people you mourn. So God said, go to the house of Jesse. Ah, I should go to the house of Jesse. <laughs> if so, he has to go kill me. Now, it's interesting. This was God talking to Samuel. If God told Samuel to go, couldn't Samuel have thought God would protect me? But you see, God allows our humanity, whatever level we are. He's going to kill me. Ah, okay. So you, you want a way out of it? Okay, tell them you have come to sacrifice to God. But was it a lie? No, he actually sacrificed God said, tell them that, take a heifer with you. So when he got there, God gave him a way around it. What was his challenge? What he thought was a problem? As though God could not handle it. Abi? Okay, so I'll give you a way around it. So he gave him a way around it, and he got there, he said, I've come to sacrifice to God. So he truly sacrificed, because that was the purpose of his going. Now, Acts chapter 5, from verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's port. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by them might fall on some of them, and so on and so forth. The Bible here does not say Peter's shadow was healing anyone. That's what the people thought. So, if you go and start looking for shadow to heal somebody, that, 
the answer is in the Bible is simple. You and I know that for there to be a shadow, there's an object that light falls upon and creates shadow. When Saul was anointed, Samuel told him, you get to so and so and so place, you meet a company of prophets prophesying, so when you get into that company, that environment, where they are, the Spirit of God will come upon you. So it was the anointing that happened based on the environment. Second, same thing happened, is, uh, uh, is written down here, I'm not just, because there are familiar places in the Bible. You know, when Samuel was, uh, David went to meet Saul, run, meet Samuel, I beg your pardon. David went to meet Samuel, he was running away from Saul. And then he went, he went to Ramah, Nioth, you remember? And then he saw sent some people. And when they got to the company, you know, he started prophesying. And then he sent a second group, and then he himself went. The same thing happened to him. So it was the, that environment, that company, that place where they were, the anointing. For there to be shadows, Peter, is because shadow pa Peter passed. So it's Peter that the anointing was, oh, it wasn't shadow. A, a shadow is nothing. Shadow doesn't exist. Shadow is just light being cast on something. The Bible doesn't tell us Peter shadow healed somebody. That's what people believe. The Bible records it. It doesn't mean that's what happened. So when we study scriptures, we should understand it and see how it applies to us. It's acting on it that produces results, not an assumption. Let me talk about conscience a little bit. Talking about, I was talking about a woman had it on from the husband you know, diverting his school fees to something else, using money for something, and then telling husband lie over something. And I'm sure some men will tell their wives lies over some things also, because there's money they want to use for something that they cannot explain, so they will find a way. Now, you know, all that kind of Christianity doesn't produce maximum result. That's also true. There are things you won't see in the Bible clearly. You go and marry Josephina. Josephina is not in the Bible. But there are guidelines based on God's word to know whether it's Josephina or not. But consciousness is such an issue. It's a major issue. First John 3 from verse 20. We're talking about the surface factor. Don't forget, a better yield. Where we're going, let me tell you up front, is not to override your conscience. As a Christian, don't override your conscience. First John 3 from verse 20. For if our conscience condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. You see, we need confidence towards God in life as believers, and we need confidence against the devil. I used to have a private dental practice. And uh, when we lived in the north, you know, when, when you are having a practice like that, you need to make up your mind, your clientele before time. You can decide you want to see 20 people in a day and have that kind of practice that you will need that number to make the money. Or you could decide you wanted to see five people in a day. And then you have a different caliber of people in mind. So the services you will render will be for different categories of people. And you will see less people and make more money. You, you have to make up your mind four times. But you see, you can't put it hard and dry that way. Occasionally we will see other kinds of people. Now, I realized at that time, having worked in government setting for years, having trained in a teaching hospital, Having been in a private clinic doing locum, I already understood how things were priced. You can't just jump out suddenly and start something. I understood how materials were used, how that after you use this amount for this person, you had made your money, and you know, all those kind of things will come with experience. So I, I was ready for private practice. And I went into private practice, and uh, I will have a full and same full and full and patient. And they will look very wretched, you know, they had come from Katu and all that, and you thought they didn't have money. My goodness. If you knew how much cash they carried, unbelievable. And you see, in life, there's a principle that richer people pay more tax than poorer people. All those boxers that you see, AJ just won. If you know how much of the amount will go in tax, when you make big money in the Western world, they tax you heavily. So that's to make life level a little bit. They will tax those who are poor too, but the richer you are, the more tax you pay. That's why rich people don't want to pay tax anywhere in the world. In Nigeria, everywhere. You see, Trump's matter. Rich people don't want to pay tax because it's so much money they, they expect to cough out. So that principle is there in life that uh, Agbalo Omeri, <laughs> Agbalo Omeri is taking from somebody who doesn't have. It's the opposite I'm saying, isn't it? So somebody who has more, you take some from him to help those who don't have enough. So when somebody had an issue, was in pain, and all of that, and they have so much. If you had made what you need to make, there was a, uh, a 
least amount that you could take for a particular service and you render it and it's okay. Knowing that a richer person will come and you can make. So there was no specific amount for some, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there was an amount that must not go below, but that, I mean, something that can be, let's say, 100 naira can also be 300 naira. It depends on how easily to come out from somebody's pocket. So a full and person will come, and because he looked poor and wretched, I will say something like, that's going to be 200, and the best is back home. Back home is no problem. There is a way somebody will say no problem that you know, ah. <laughs> so very quickly I will say, but you also need to pay for, now as far as I was concerned, if he had been okay with what I said, there will be no need to charge extra for something else. And I would say, but you also need to pay back home again, ah, like that. Hey. And I would say, but so, 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 after a while, my conscience will check me. <laughs> my conscience will bother me, so I knew that was the limit I could go, based on my conscience. Because anything outside that will be seen for me. It might not be seen for someone else. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says, anybody who knows to do good and doesn't do it to him, it is sin. There are some sins that are not universal. There are some things that are specific, specific based on your work with God, based on your exposure. These are the kinds of things I'm talking about as per surface, topography. When ground is undulating, it might not be safe for everybody. So don't say because everybody is doing it, you too can do it. If your conscience bothers you over something, please don't go ahead. These are some reasons why somebody may not have as much yield in life as the person you have. If it's making sense, please shout hallelujah. So I will say, then I will go back and I say, no, just let's leave it the way it was before. The person would think I was nice. But you see, it's my conscience. It's my conscience that bothered me. Let me read something. Ezekiel chapter 4 from verse 9. And also Ezekiel, God was speaking to Ezekiel, take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt, and put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it. God was telling him, let there be some prophetic symbolic actions. On this side, like this way, that represents Israel, and this one, that represents Judah, you know, so along the line, God was telling him what to do. And your food, which you eat, shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day, from, from time to time, you shall eat it. You shall also drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hin, from time to time, you shall drink. You shall eat it as barley cakes, and bake it using fuel of human waste in their side. Take note, human waste. Then the Lord said, so shall children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles where I will drive them. So I said, ah, Lord God, indeed I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. Then he said to me, that is God said to me, see, I'm giving you cow dung instead of human waste, and you shall prepare your bread. I find that place very amusing, very amusing. God was telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I want to do something that will represent something to Israel. So use human dust. Oh, true, 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 true. I've never, in my, since I was born, to God, I've never used human dust. Now, why was he not doing that? Was it not because of God? It was because of God, because of God's law, he thought. Was why, so it was not that God. He had no doubt that God was the one talking to him. So he was telling God that, ah, no, I can't do that. So, okay, okay, okay. God said, okay, no problem. Use animal What's the difference? And that was okay by him. What does this tell me? It tells me that Ezekiel was saying to God, my conscience will bother me. If I eat that one, since I believe it's wrong, okay, 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 go ahead. It's not because of me. If I were to go, I would say, Ezekiel, 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 how many times did I call you? Why is the reason, if I were to ask what is the reason why you will not think? It's not because of God. And you know it's God talking to you. Don't you have sense? That's what I told him. But God said, okay, sure. She, you know, this generation, they write she as she, isn't it? They put S-H-E-Y. That's how this generation writes she. F9, Yoruba, that's what they will get. She, you, you don't want human waste. Are you okay? You add my waste. What's the difference? So that, uh, I can use that one. So God allowed him. That tells me the place of conscience. So when your conscience will bother you over something to you, it's wrong. But I see there that God is not legalistic, you know. Yeah, I see that there. And uh, we, we see that in the Bible also. God told them they were to, to uh, be circumcised on the eighth day. And uh, in Joshua's days, when they got to Gilgal, the Bible says God told them to circumcise. Because the 40 years that they had been going around the wilderness, they were not circumcised. And God didn't kill them, you see. 
Because God knew what it was after. It's about circumcision, what it means in the New Testament. So the fact that they didn't do those 40 years, God is not legalistic. There are reasons why he does things. So in Acts 23, talking about conscience from verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest and Anas commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. The man must have used it to some going away for me. You have lived in all good conscience. So who, who, who are you to say that? Slap his mouth. And then they slapped him. And um, Paul said, God, God will smite you. you to wash your. He said, high priest. <laughs> I didn't know it was a high priest. But this was really what Paul wanted to say. I have lived now. Because it's like, okay, then the human being say that. So he modified it next time he was going to say it so that he won't slap him again. Acts 24, 16. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. It's the same thing he said. He just puts in a way that will not let him be slapped. So that's the key. To try to live for your conscience to be free of offense towards God and towards men. So anything that will make me to have a guilty conscience towards God, other people may not consider it an issue, but for me it's an issue. So when David caught a tip of Saul's robe, his conscience smote him. I mean, other people thought, you have the opportunity to kill the bagger. Get rid of him and get to what God wanted to do. But just cutting the rope, it smote his conscience. He said, no, 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 I can't, I can't. I can't, I can't do that. I can't touch the Lord's anointed. He did not override his conscience. It's very wise to maintain a tender conscience before God. Don't ever override your conscience as a believer. If your conscience judges you, repent. If it's before God, you are sorry. If it's before men, make amends. Don't override your conscience. We're talking about somebody who wants maximum yield in life. Because there are things you won't see spelled out like I gave an example of Josephine. You won't see Josephine in the Bible. But if you walk in the light of God's word and you are a serious Christian, you see, conscience can change. Because if you believe something is wrong at the stage of your work with God, your conscience will bother you. If you know more and you don't believe it's wrong anymore, your conscience will not bother you anymore, even though it used to bother you about the same thing before. But if when it bothered you, you chose to override it, you will not be confident towards God. Neither will you be confident against the devil. These are some reasons why some people experience some things and others don't. We're talking about the surface factor. So level your ground. Don't override your conscience. Maintain a tender conscience. At the edge of a cliff, borderline, is, is it true? We should be able to say it's true or it's not true. There's no need to say it's not a lie. There's no need to deceive our husbands or our wives. Let's convince them we need a, a new pair of shoes. Or let's do our own work so that we can afford it too. However, there are some things that husband and wife will not see eye to eye on because they're just masculine or feminine issues. We should marry the kind of person that we can be ourselves with that even if we don't agree on everything 100%, we respect each other enough to accommodate things that are not sinful. Can somebody please say amen? Lastly, the shower factor. Or you can call it sunshine factor, whatever. We're talking about rainfall, sunshine. We're talking about the weather. We're talking about climate. This affects the yield of the ground also. Because no matter what you put in place, if rain does not fall, and there's nothing you can do about rain, if there's not enough sun, there's nothing you can do except to pray. And that's where we're anchoring this. Pastor Otto had so much to say to us about prayer on Saturday during the last trading. And we heard it also at the first service today. In Matthew 5 from verse 43, the Bible reads, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spiteful use you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the You see, it's God's prerogative to bring rain. In Acts 14, 17, nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So we're talking about things that only God can do. You can't make rain. I know there's supposed to be rain makers. I don't believe it. From the Bible, is God that gives rain or sun and all those things. Yeah, I know technology can do some things now. A couple of years ago, I was told in Dubai, you know, geography tells us about evaporation and condensation and condensation and something. That's why the rain shines when it falls. 
one geography teacher said that long ago. So I understand they can do that with technology now. But do you know in the book of Amos, Bible, eh? Amos 9 6, look at this. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. In Amos' days, man did not know that there was evaporation. Man didn't know that it was water that was on the ground that would go up, that would become rain. How come Amos could write it? Inspiration. There's so much that man has not found out yet. Back to what we were saying. So you can't make rain yourself. You can't make sun to shine by yourself except to pray. So we're saying, having seen the other factors we have seen, it's important to consider the shower factor or sunshine factor as well. We're talking about the weather, the climate, rainfall, sunshine, things that we can't do something about except we pray. Second Chronicles chapter 6 from verse 26. When the heavens are shut up, Solomon was dedicating the temple. And there's no rain because they have sinned against you. When they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven, forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. When there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone, or by all your people Israel, when each one knows his own body and his grief and spreads out his hand to this place, then hear from heaven and so on and so forth. He was talking about plagues, mildew. He was talking about natural things that will consider everybody's problem. And Solomon was saying, whether it's individuals who prayed or corporate people who prayed, he was saying these things that we call natural things that prayer can do something against them. So we need to look upon God and depend on him to have maximum yield. You see, the other things we said, surface factor, all of them, natural human knowledge acknowledges all those things, like hard work, like integrity, all the things we have said. But there's a difference, believe me. Christianity is different. It's not just about what they teach in management, what they teach in leadership. Those things are good, they're important. But if it's not on the wings of prayer to God. Access through the blood of the Lamb is not the same. It is not the same. A Christian must never forget that. That we are not to live life naturally. We are to live life by the Spirit. And we have access to God only through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. If what is happening to everybody is what is happening to me, then how am I different? Psalm 121 from verse 1. I will look up to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help from from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. We had so much about God's help at the first service. Psalm 127 verse 1. Except the Lord King James, or unless the Lord New King James builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless or except the Lord watches over his city, the watchmen wake up in vain. Except the Lord. That God factor is an issue. Psalm 128 from verse 1 blesses everyone who fears God who walks in his ways. Thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shall that be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be like a fruitful vine by the side, and so on and so forth. That God factor is an issue. There was a man named Jabez. We're going to read about him in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Jabez is not known for any heroic thing he did. Jabez is known for the prayer he prayed. But what we want to see is simply is Jabez's prayer gave him a better yield in life. First Chronicles 4 from verse 9. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. You know, we saw that as part of the good ground. King James says, honest ground. Nick James says, honorable. More honor, you know, with honor and so on and so forth. So Jabez was more honorable, the Bible says, than his brothers. So he was any good ground, if you like. His mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him with pain or sorrow. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, meaning Jabez prayed, Oh, that you will bless me indeed, and enlighten my territory, that your hand will be with me, and that you will keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. So what did God grant him? What he prayed, the prayer point we just saw, that you will bless me indeed, God granted it. You enlighten my territory. Does that mean he will not go to work? He will go to work. 
But the Bible is telling us the reason for his productivity was not the work he did. It's because of the prayer he prayed. That's how God enlarged his territory and his hand was with him and God kept him from evil that was not going to cause pain. Jabez is not remembered for any work that he did. He's remembered for this short prayer. And because of this prayer, everything changed for him in life. And even though there was good yield before, it became better yield. Do you have a prayer life? So we were told that we should pray as though everything depends on God and we should walk as though everything depends on us. We saw that leadership training. Some people have quoted the leadership training, they will never come. If you know what you are missing out on, we have, we have someone in church, a permanent secretary, who told us one day that the things she had at leadership training were the things that made her to secure that position. I'm sure many of us were there when she said it. Unless I'm not in town, I don't miss leadership training. I want to receive more. I want to learn more. You remember, we started from six factor, isn't it? I don't know how many books you have read this year. I think I'm reading a sixth book. I'm talking, I'm talking about fat books or hundreds of pages. First Chronicles chapter 5 from verse 18. First Chronicles 5 from verse 18. The sons of Reuben, the Gadites, and half tribe of Manasseh, had 44,760 billion men, men able to bear shield and sword, to shoot with the bow, and skillful in war who went to war. So they were armed, they were skillful, so everything to win they had. They made war with Hagrides, Jethro, Nafish, and Nodab, and they were held against them, and the Hagrides were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer because they put their trust in him. These guys were armed. This guy had a requisite skill. They went to school. All that it took to succeed, they had. But the Bible is telling us now that what put them over was none of those things. It's because they cried to God and God heard them and made it happen. I want to ask again, do you have a prayer life? So some are working and they are doing their best. And some are working also, but they know they can talk to God in the place of prayer. They can't have the same result in life, believe me. They can't. So that's what we're calling surface factor today. Sorry, that's what we're calling shower factor today or the sunshine factor. What is not in our hands that only God can bring about, but it's only through prayer we can bring it down. Do you have a prayer life? Anybody who has been a serious Christian for a while, who has a solid prayer life, we tell you not one thing, not two things, not three things of what they know couldn't have happened except for God. And maybe while at this, I should point out that we are not to idolize prayer, you see? Because sometimes people idolize prayer. They think the issue is prayer. No, prayer is not the issue. God is the issue. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. It's because prayer is what gives us access to God. When man talks to God, it's called prayer. It's not your, hey, pray, 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 pray. And you are just praying. Pray about what? Is it biblical? Is it Christ? Yeah, the prayer is not the issue. God is the issue. It's because prayer gives us access to God that we emphasize prayer in Christianity. Because if it's just about prayer, 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 whether you are sleeping or pray, 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 pray. I was in a church recently, and I told them I was there many years ago during an all-night service, and somebody was praying like this. Ah, serious matter. During prayer, all-night prayer, I said he was feeling sleepy. I didn't know. I said he dreamt openly. Like, yes, ago I was here. Because person, ah, when someone is praying, like that, my goodness. Not long after Yakata, he had slept. He just wanted to keep himself awake. Only God knows the kind of work he did during the day. You think, uh, pray. <laughs> I shall look when he was really sleeping. Not too long after I saw him, he was, he was sprawled over the chair, fast asleep. So anybody who saw him and thought that was the way to pray. <laughs> what am I saying? You want to pray about something and you're open to God and God says, don't pray. Say to him, so, so, and so. If you pray at that time, it's disobedience. If you say what God said to say, that's when you will see the miracle. So don't idolize prayer. Prayer gives us access to God through Jesus Christ. So that relationship with God through Jesus is the issue. Yes, want to pray. Pray. Have a prayer life. But we are saying it's really God that is the issue and bring him on the scene in our day-to-day -day affairs of life. 
That's why we must have a prayer life. But if you want to pray and God gives you instruction, you better obey. Because to obey is better than sacrifice. You remember? Yeah. Sacrifice here represents anything that man will do to give us access to God. It's not sacrifice in the sense of sacrificing. I'm sacrificing for you children. No. Sacrifice was killing an animal, putting blood. So prayer is what sacrifice represents there. So obedience is better than prayer. So if you see something in the Bible, there's nothing to pray about it. People waste prayer. Father, we want to give tithe now. Please, open the windows of heaven. He already said he will do so. If you do so, I will open it. So rather, thank him for opening the windows of heaven. That's how to pray. Thank you for opening the windows of heaven. Instead of saying, Father, open the windows. He said he will do it. Where you do? So why are you? I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And there are things I say, look, even if we don't pray after offering, I'm sure some people will stop us. You didn't pray. The Bible says, give and shall be given you. Whether we pray formally or not, the Bible says, give and shall be given you. If nobody prays, so if we take offering and we continue the service, you thank God that he already gave unto you. Good, may your prayers and you do know. That, the religion, we like religion. So that's why there's so much of thanksgiving in the Bible. In everything I pray with, with supplication, we with thanksgiving. Because if God already says something, you should be thanking God for it. Instead of asking, I say, Holy Father, answer. Father, ah, what, what? He said he will do something. You do so, so, I will do so, so, so. And you have done so, 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 so. Yeah, why, why do you think? Is he a liar? So thank him for it and move on. So the things we should be concentrating prayer on. Instead of praying against enemy. Instead of praying, you know, these things that, that matter, that will change the world that we should be praying about. Not shuke, shuke, another shoe, another bag, another, all of those things that are, they're just supposed to be things that we accompany it. Seek it first, the kingdom of God's righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Is it making sense? Okay, so let's stand to pray. Let's give God thanks and praise and honor. If you got anything personally today, appreciate him for it. Appreciate him for it. Give him glory and honor. So we started with seeds factor. Taking more seed. However you can do that. Taking more seed. Study the word more until you see what God is saying. Go for that seminar. Attend that course. Do what you need to do for the word to become flesh to you. Until what God says is a revelation to you personally. Nobody can take it from you. If you act on it, there's nothing. no devil can stop you from prospering in life. I always knew my marriage would work. I always knew my children would do well. Anybody who has been in my mind from the beginning, I always said it. I, I was too sure. I, I always knew I would live to be old. I always, all those things, there's nothing devil can do about them. Because it's in the Bible. And I see it for myself, how it can be to me. And nobody can take it away. So what are you going to do about the seeds factor? Soil factor, manure, compost, fertilizer. We make good soil to be better soil. So add what you need. Are you always arguing? Are you always late? Are you always rude? People are always complaining about this and that. You know, yeah, fruit is your fruit, fruit of the spirit. Surface factor, borderline. Eh, it's not a lie, but is it true? Eh, I'm not hurting anybody. Inconvenient jesting, we read all that. We read about misconception, things that the Bible doesn't say, and then you are putting your faith on that. Instead of understanding what the Bible says, so you can put your faith where it should be. Never overriding our conscience. So, level your ground. Things that your heart is bothering you about, you shouldn't do it. Shower or sunshine factor, weather, climate, they are not in our hands. Only God can do something about those. So, of course, prayer is important. If you want to get ahead in life, you must have a prayer life. You must look up to him from where comes your help. Go accept the Lord. Labor him in the building. Jabez was already good ground, but his ground was better because he could pray. Rebenaz gathered half tribe of Manasseh. They were armed. They were skilled. But it's a prayer that did it. So pray and then prepare for good weather. Elisha told that woman, go and gather empty vessels. Don't gather a few. In other words, prepare for what is coming. That can be somebody's word today. Prepare for what is coming. Yeah. If you have prayed, then go and prepare for what is coming. Make empty room. Prepare for what is coming. You know what is coming. If you have prayed, you have talked to God, then go and gather, don't gather a few because you are the one that will limit what's going to happen. 
Let the people praise thee, O Lord. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. The Lord our God shall bless us. So our work with God affects our productivity in life. Our work with God affects our material prosperity. Our work with God affects what we yield. So no more 36, no more 64, but a hundredfold. That's what you desire. That's what I desire. That's a maximum. And we can head for it in Jesus' name. So in good ground, there are very yields. So what are you going to do personally as we pray? So please pray. Father, we thank you today. We are grateful for your word to us. Thank you for what specific things individuals must do because we are not the same and our situations are not the same. And whatever you are getting across to every individual now, we ask that you help us to attend to them and apply them to our lives. And thank you because our yields will be better than before. We can always have a better yield. Until we leave the surface of the earth, for us it will always be better. Thank you, thank you, and thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're still praying, please. So bow down your head. Shut your eyes. If God brings anything to your mind now, write it down so you won't forget. You need healing for your body. Maybe you have tried and it's not working. Now we have seen that what things, other things we not do because we can pray. God can do. Ordinarily, I would say prayer will do. And that's the truth. I see many that way prayer will do. But I just deliberately emphasize that fact that prayer is not the issue. It's God that is the issue. Because prayer is what gives us access to him. That's why we must pray. That's why we need. So, through prayers, what cannot happen naturally can happen. Would you like to stand and receive your miracle today? You need healing for your body. There's something that is persistent. You have tried. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Prayer can make it happen. Because God can make it happen. Please lay your hand on that part. And expect to be healed. Expect to be touched by God. Expect for there to be a miracle. Because he loves you and sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. I like to see it this way. If I were the only one on earth, Jesus would have still come to die for me. Father, hands are laid on different parts of the body. We rebuke aches, pains, infirmities. And we declare that only you can solve all these issues and your power will know no decrease. And thank you for your power makes whole now. I command healing in every case in the name of Jesus Christ. Please say, I receive my healing now in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for doing it. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Do you have any other need, something else you want us to pray about? Will you please stand and present it to God? Just present it to him in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says his eyes are upon the righteous. His ears are open to our prayers. So me, I don't pray prayers like, Father, all the prayers we pray today, answer them in Jesus' name. He already said he will. So you present your need to him and thank him for the answer. Father, your word says all things whatsoever ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. The children are bringing their needs before you because they have trust in you. We saw that earlier. That the Reubenites and co, because they trusted in God, that's what gave them the victory. And for everyone standing now and bringing these issues to you, we trust you absolutely. And we receive the granting of every heart's desire in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing it. You may be seated. Finally, I want to pray for you if you are here. You are not right with God. You want to be. Salvation is only through Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Peter said that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Neither is there salvation in any other. So there are some absolutes in life. One of them is salvation only through Jesus. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to be saved. It's, it's only through Jesus Christ. You're here today. You're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be saved through Jesus Christ. If you will lift your hand, I know you want to be prayed for. If I see your hand, I'm going to ask you to put it on your chest and lead you in a simple prayer. You want to be born again. Can I see your hand, please, above your head? Thank you. You can put your hand on your chest now. You're a backsliding Christian. You want to return? Please lift your hand where you are. 
Anybody? Bachelor in Christian who would like to return. Is there anyone? I knew the Lord, served the Lord. I want to come back to him today. There's no other way to God. Jesus is the way. We were told earlier in the service. Not a way. The way. Is there any other hand? Just in case, if, you're, if you lifted your hand, I didn't see you, put it on your chest. And please pray this prayer after me. Yes, I saw you, my sister. Everybody like that, please pray after me. And even if you're at home, you can do the same. Say, Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Jesus died for me. He rose again. I invite him into my life now to be my personal Lord and Savior. I receive grace to live for you for the rest of my life. My life will begin to bring forth fruit today. Not 30 or 60, but 100 fold. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray for you now. Can you stand? If you prayed that prayer, please stand. God bless you. See, pick, put your hand on your chest. Anybody else? Thank you, Father, for your daughter who prayed this prayer. Thank you for, from today, you make yourself real to her. We break the hold of the devil over her life and we release her to you that you will enable her to run this race successfully to the end. Very soon, people will see so much difference in her life. Things that only God can do will become her daily experience. We receive it with gratitude. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody is by your side. Please just follow her. Take your bag. Just, just go with her. God bless you.